Okay, First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, reading. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, be, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of and the, and the flower and the, thereof fail, falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the God word which by the gospel is preached unto you. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us turn to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again that we can gather leaving the world aside and to be found in thy house to study your word and lord we pray that you would remove all distraction in our hearts all the thoughts and worries of life and lord may you use your word to refresh strengthen and draw us onto thyself we pray especially that you would use it to help us to love our savior more and to cause us to live lives that will be obedient to him bringing much joy and glory to your name. And Lord, we also pray that you help the younger ones to be able to follow, that they may learn your word from a young age. Lord, we pray that you would bless this meeting with your presence. May your Holy Spirit truly work a work of grace in every hearer's heart. We pray once again for cleansing, for washing in the blood of our Saviour, for we dare not approach thy throne with sin in our hearts. We ask and pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now last week when we were together, we learned some important words. And one of them is this word found in um, verse 17. Verse 17, and it is the word sojourning. Sojourning. Peter would repeat this concept in his letter to the Christians. In chapter 1, he talked about, chapter 1 verse 1, he says, to the strangers scattered throughout, to the strangers. The same concept of the sojourner. The sojourner is a stranger in a foreign land, living in a foreign land. And here he will bring up this concept of sojourners again. And also in chapter 2 verse 9, he would talk about a peculiar people, a holy nation. A nation that is set apart from the nations of the world. Now we are called, in this chapter, we are actually called a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. The church, the people of God. And again, the peculiar people being aliens in this world. So this concept is very important and we must, as Christians, have a clear picture in our mind about being a sojourner on earth. Do you feel yourself to be a sojourner? What is a sojourner? So time for revision. Um, Jeremy, sojourner. Some ideas. 
very good a one that is stopping over and it's just temporary so it's temporary remember the sojourner must have a sense of not permanency in this world a sense of just being very temporal passing through we sing the hymn this world is not my home i'm just a passing through right it is scriptural it's biblical so the concept of being temporal do you have that sense now when you are feeling temporal feeling very temporal how would you behave maybe i ask practically right how would you behave practically um, thomas when you feel like i'm just temporary in the place what would you do or what you would you not do You would look forward to something. You're temporary. You're just stopping through, passing by. You're on a journey somewhere. And you're just always looking forward to that journey. Someone who is a traveler knows that he's going to a destination. I take a flight from here to here. I stop over. I'm staying temporarily in a hotel. Then I'm waiting for my next flight. Then I catch my next flight until I finally reach my destination. I'm always looking forward to this permanent place that I will finally be at which is why the apostles spent time talking about many things look at chapter 1 verse 4 there's the incorruptible undefiled fadeth not away inheritance reserved in heaven for you so he is painting a picture of the Christian's home is in heaven this is very temporal what else would you not do for example, um, um, Howard, you don't build, you don't take roots. Um, okay, that will come to another concept. But when you are temporary in this place, for example, are you going to stay the whole night in church tonight? Temporary, right? If it's temporary, um, what are some of the things that will pass your mind? Okay, while well, you think I ask another one, Sujin. You see, this is an important concept. Peter keeps talking about us being temporal on earth, and then the permanency is in heaven. Then we must have some real practical um, thoughts about being a temporary person on this earth, right? Uh, Sujin. Very good. I won't invest too much in the present. Right? I give an example always. You stay in a hotel, you don't go spend money to buy things to decorate the hotel room. You know you're temporary there. It's just a place to sleep, to eat, shelter, and then you do not use your resources to decorate the life on earth. Right? So that's one example. So you are temporary in church. You just prepare some things and you're always ready to go. Are you ready to go? When it's temporary, we are always ready and happy to leave this world. I hope you're not ready and happy to leave church, right? Temporary, I'm ready to leave. It is something that you know is temporary. I just come. Now, who is sitting at the same seat as last week? All right, most of you change seat, I notice, because you hope I don't notice you and ask you a question. Do you come in? Well, this is my seat. I must sit here. It's fine if you do, all right? We, We allocate it. But I say, wherever is fine, right? If that, oh, that is available, I just sit. We become less picky about life, correct? When life is not, this is so important, I can't live without it. Then you know it is, you don't have that sense that this is temporary. All right, what house I live in? What car I drive? What do I have? What do I possess? What job do I have? Is it such that if I don't, get that job if i don't get that promotion if i don't have this particular degree if i don't have this thing that i want to achieve in my life i'm so angry and so upset and so dissatisfied a temporary person doesn't matter doesn't feel it matters wait those that sit at different seats um valerie are you sitting in the same seat you're sitting in the same seat really i thought last week you sat there michelle are you sitting in the same seat are, are you very upset that you didn't get that same seat? 
Why? Wait, let me ask you, at home, do you have a favourite seat that if, if your brother sits there, you, uh, you I want to sit there? Uh, no? My, my room, yeah. My room. This is my room, right? This is my room. You get upset. But in church, why not? It's more temporary than home, correct? It's very temporary. This is fine too. As long as it, it fulfills its purpose, this is fine. The sojourner's concept in the Bible is something that is very established. The people, the children of Israel, they must learn that they were sojourners in the wilderness. They must learn that when in the land, they were also just temporary um, um, occupants of the land. That's all. But the children of Israel forgot and they made the earthly home like as if it's a permanent stay. Do you know how they were asked to choose? Do you just walk into the land? When they, when they took the land, when they took cities, God says, their houses will be your house. Their lands will be your land. Their farm will be your farm. They just walk, literally walk, all right, this house, I'll, I'll, I'll walk in, I'll stay, oh, this is my farm. That's it. Of course, the land, the particular areas were allocated to them. So you imagine if you were the Israelites, how would you be? When you took over the city and then you know you're going to stay there, what are you going to do? Students, how are you like when you first enter class? I remember when I was a kid, when I first entered class, before that I'm thinking, where do I want to sit this year? Once I get to class, run in and then make sure I sit in that seat for the rest of the year. Are we like that? We are so obsessed. The children of Israel, maybe some of them in their heart, this house is not that as nice as the one. Then all of them running to the double story one or the bigger one. And then shoving and pushing each other out, out of my way. I want this house. Now if we are like that, then we hold things so tightly. And we say, if I don't have this, or if I lose this, it's like as if I can't live anymore. Then you know you, you are not a sojourner anymore. You have become a citizen of this carnal world. Alright, remember that. Same for your dreams, for your children. This is just, we are just passing through. We have things to do for God while we are passing through. That is all. Afterwards, he's going to emphasize even more on this temporal concept of a sojourner, alright? So just remember, temporal, good. What is another concept, remember? C, starts with a C. Uh, Terry, remember? Comfort, very good. Comfort, when we aim to make ourselves comfortable. These people were going through persecutions. Their life were extremely uncomfortable. Maybe uncomfortable is not even the word to use to describe their lives. They will sleep in caves. They will sleep in the wilderness. They may be pursued, killed any time. They're always moving. Their lives were very uncomfortable. That's why they were reminded, you are just a journal. It's like that. It's like that. Now, can you think of examples of a sojourner that or rather, what a sojourner should do when it comes to comfort, or should not do. Uh, Ellen. You understand my question? Don't understand. You are, you're a sojourner of a Christian on earth. All right? One of the concepts is, we must not be obsessed with pursuing comfort on earth. Okay? So give examples of what you should do or should not do. Buy things that you need from home. Okay, say more. <laughs> Do you need a luxury sofa? Or just a sofa that you can sit on? That's good enough. You, oh, that's really about comfort, okay. <laughs> you must spend your resources, your pursuit and all to make your life 
very comfortable. And if anything that comes in your way of being able to make your life comfortable, you're willing to compromise your Christian faith. You're willing to give up your Christian walk. If to have a more comfortable life on earth, I'm willing to work and study so hard that it does not matter if I'm not close to God, it does not matter if I'm not serving God, it does not matter if I'm not um, um, walking ho uh, holy lives, it does not matter as long as it gets me ahead in life. Actually, student, why do you study hard? Jemima, why do you study hard? Don't bring shame to God's name. All right, related to comfort. Or maybe, why do you think most people of the world, students in the world, why do they study hard and want to get good grades? Earn more money. Why do they want to earn more money? It's just paper. Right? If you have better grades, I think I'll get better jobs. I get better jobs, I get better salary. And I've, why do I want better salary? Too young to think about those things. Most of the people is so that I can have a luxurious life, right? I want to have these things for my family. I look at my neighbors, how they live, what they drive, what the children have. I also want to make sure that I want that kind of life of luxury, comfort. Is there not a cost? In the Christian walk, these people faced a great cost. They can easily just compromise and their lives will be very comfortable. Now, if you are a person that is obsessed with wanting a very good life, eat well, um, have nice things, it's very dangerous because you will soon be willing to give up your walk with God in order to have comfort. Keep remembering, sojourners, students, you are, are you sojourners in Perth now? Uh, most of you who are away from your own country, sojourners, all right? For example, um, Jilin, sojourner. All right. How do you feel as a sojourning student in Perth? In terms of maybe your um, accommodations. Temporary. Does it matter if your toilet bowl is not um, very comfortable, your bed is very springy and all that? It's just temporary. After this, you're going home, right? That's it. If you start to think that way about your Christian walk on earth, you'll be very different. Your life will change. So that is why there is this reminder of the permanency, temporalness, the comfort. And yes, now you start to acquire things, you start to get things, you start to feel that you want to make this world your home. You sink roots, all right? One of you say, your roots start to sink in here. You're so acclimatized to this world. I use the example fish out of water. Fish can be out of water for a short while. All right? But all the while, it's very uncomfortable for the fish. It will find its, it will flap, it will find its way to jump back into the water. That is the sojourner's life. You will be very uncomfortable with anything that takes you away from your quiet time. Anything that takes, away, takes you away from prayer time. Anything that takes you away from Bible studies, at home, in church, serving Him. Anything that is related to your heavenly home, activities that are related to your heavenly home, your spiritual walk, as long as you're deprived of that, you can only tolerate it for so long. In fact, all the while when you're deprived of it, you are extremely unhappy and uncomfortable. It's like as if you will die. The opposite to the other one. If I don't have the things of the world, I will die. But the sojourner just can't wait. When is the next flight out? 
When is the next train coming? When can I get closer to my destination? That will be the idea. So when you think of sojourner, think of that. You are a fish anytime you are not close to your Lord, deprived of being close to your Lord, you just keep jumping and jumping and jumping. Just want to jump back into the, comf- the, the environment in which you can breathe spiritually. You are comfortable spiritually. Are you like that? Students, are you very comfortable with your friends in the world? Or every time you are with friends in the world, working person too, you're with your colleagues in, of the world, and then you just are thinking, when, when will office work be over so that I can go back and be with the Lord or go to church to study His Word and fellowship? Or if you had to go for a company event, I wish I didn't have to go. So I just want to get back into the water. That is where I breathe. Where I breathe spiritually. Are you so uncomf- Are you so happy to be with friends of the world? And you breathe very happily there. Or you feel suffocating. This is suffocating. Certain conversations, this is suffocating. It's just about the world, that's all. Nothing to do about Christ. Such a suffocating environment. I can't wait to get home to do family worship, to pray, to be in my own room. So Michelle, if you want your room to yourself because you want to go there and pray and seek the Lord, that is good. right? We want to be in the environment where I am comfortable because it's a spiritual environment. All right, so the sojourner, please have some of these ideas. We can go on and on. But do not be comfortable if you know that you have become very comfortable in this world. Now, next. So we learned that word. We study a bit more about that word. Now, we studied another word because about this word sojourning, sojourning here in fear, we studied this word, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. As I reminded you last week, everything from this word, pass the time of your sojourning in fear, from verses 18 to verse 25, except the last part of verse 25, is all linked. Understand that, all right? So in the Greek language, it is linked to this one word, pass the time. So you must understand this word, pass the time, because everything else is about how you pass your time on earth. So what is pass your time? Anyone remember? Pass your time. Um, who was here last week? Sing Yun. Do you remember? Pass your, the time. Very good. It literally means occupy yourself, busy yourself with. Busy yourself with these thoughts, these following thoughts. Busy yourself remembering your sojourner. Always remembering your sojourner. The students that are overseas students here, I'm sure you feel that way. Everything is just very temporary. All right? All right? If something breaks, just mend it. Don't need to buy a new one. It's temporary anyway. But the, fam- the PRs here, permanent residents here, the, the, the people that, that are born here, the citizens here, do we have the same sense of temporal living? If not, God says, pass the time of your sojourning. Means constantly occupy ourselves with this thought. It must be something that is very often in the foreground of your mind. Temporary, temporary. All right, the next time your wife says, Husband, the fridge is broken. What do you say, husband? Frank, what will you say? Get a new one. Right? That's how I'm not saying temporary, all right, wife? No need to buy a new fridge. We are not saying that. But the question is, get a new one what? Let's buy the most expensive, the biggest, the most stylish, even if it doesn't work, but because it's branded? No. Just live practically on earth, that's it. Alright, that is what God says. Now, I'm not saying 
we should all buy low quality things and then I'm not saying that, right? Just be clear. We must know our heart as temporary sojourners. Okay? The temporary sojourner spends his time and energy and resources. Spends his time, energy and resources to forward himself in the journey. Remember that. No sojourner spends his time, money and resources to stay in a place as long as he can to enjoy the place as much as he can. No, he's always just thinking what to use my time, money and resources to push my spiritual walk ahead. Yes, question. <laughs> Sojourner, is it a refugee or a, or a traveller? Define refugee in your mind. It's refugee like going to a destination suffering <laughs> Okay, good question. So is, is a sojourner a refugee, like a refugee kind or like a traveller kind? Definition of refugee is like you, you are suffering, <laughs> right? Stay in refugee camp, treated like no rights um, uh, of citizenship. So that's refugee. Now, then traveller is I'm travelling, sightsee, I enjoy the location. So what do you think sojourner should be like? Uh, Kazaya, sitting next to her, you're smiling. Alright, so we as people on earth, we enjoy as we are going through this world, but we must expect that the rain might pour, there might be troubles. Alright, what do you mean by enjoy while we are here? Alright, God give us time, so we should use it the best. What is the best way to enjoy time? Be a good witness for him. You ask some people, what's the best way to enjoy time? Go to the movies, go to restaurants, sleep more. But if... So, how do you answer? Refugee or traveller? Well, I will answer it this way. God uses the word sojourner. Should we enjoy our walk on earth? Of course. But the enjoyment must always be what kind of enjoyment? Spiritual enjoyment. Do you enjoy coming to church? You should. I'm a refugee, alright? I come here, suffer, suffer, suffer. We should enjoy everything spiritual. Enjoy in the sense of being thankful, enjoy in the sense, use it for the kingdom of God. Relish in spiritual things. Relish the thought of heaven. Relish the thought of being able to serve Him. Relish the thought of, I can finish my homework and now I can study the Word of God. Relish those things. So in that sense, we still enjoy, all right? But the enjoyment of like holidayers, holidayers go to a destination by and large just to live hedonistically. You know, hedonistically means I just want to eat as much as I can, right? Take taxi here, there, 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 there. Eat, 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 and then go back, get diarrhea, and then never mind. Then take take Lomotil so that I can go and eat, 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 eat again. That's all I care about. And then just go sightsee, 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 sightsee. Skip worship, skip everything. Now, I'm not saying we don't take holidays. I'm not saying that in holidays, you cannot sightsee. You go holidays, you land, you do witnessing and that's all. I'm not saying that. You can go for holiday. But what you enjoy on holiday? Yes, I decide I enjoy the creation of God. I give glory to God. I tell my children, look, God created all these things. Can you see all this that we don't see in Perth? You can tell your children. All right, so now we are on holiday. You see, you don't have to do homework. Tonight we can have, we can enjoy one hour family worship. You enjoy the spiritual aspects. Okay, so we're not saying Christians are supposed to not enjoy life at all. But depends what you mean by enjoy the sights, enjoy the location. All right. Do we enjoy the blessings that God gives us? Depends what you mean by enjoy. Enjoy it for yourself, not good. If God gives you an increment, how do you want to enjoy your increment? Uh, as, um, 
pay, you get a $1,000 increment. Wow! How would you want to enjoy that blessing? Use it for God's work. Do you enjoy using it for God's work or you enjoy using it for yourself? So, Christians do enjoy the spiritual aspects of a sojourner. Alright, so can you enjoy food? Should you enjoy food? No, we should not enjoy food. Everything, make sure no salt, no pepper, just plain rice, plain water. We are not talking about that. Because there was a Christianity that was like that. Well, a cult that was like that, that claimed to be Christi Christians. All right, um, so we are not talking about that kind of life. Okay, does it help you understand a bit better? All right, yes, so spiritual enjoyment of walking with the Lord, using everything for the Lord. Learn to enjoy that. You learn to enjoy that, you know you're a sojourner because you are, you are storing your, you're setting your affections on things above. You're storing your treasure in things for things above. All right. Do you enjoy spending money to buy things for yourself, or do you enjoy spending money for the work of the Lord? Now, next, then we. All right. So occupy yourself. Are you occupying yourself to always remember? I am a sojourner. So remember, busy yourself with this thought. Now, next. In fact, this be, this passing your time. I remind you again. It, is, it has to do with overturning things. Overturning things. So it's like chosen to describe, can you overturn your thinking as Christians being persecuted? Overturn it. Because you just keep wondering, why, as, why am I persecuted after I became a Christian? Why is my life more difficult? Because I walk a holy life. So he said, can you turn your thinking around, turn it upside down and occupy now with the thought that you are a sojourner. Maybe you think, I don't think that Christians should be sojourners. Then say, time to turn it upside down and say, I am a sojourner because God says so. Now next, let's move. Now, what are we redeemed from? Look at verse 18. Last week, we studied for as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversations. And we talk about, but you're redeemed, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ. So you're redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But redeem, you know what you're not redeemed with? You're not, you know what you're redeemed with. But now, redeemed from what? Verse 18. We are redeemed from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. All right, so question 40. What are we redeemed from? From. He described what we are redeemed with. Now he says what we are redeemed from. From vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. That word conversation again. All right, vain means um, empty, useless of no profit, vain, no effect, all right, vain. Vain conversation, we said, has to do with your life, your lifestyle, your beliefs, what you are, received by tradition, tradition as handed down, taught by their fathers. Now, what do you think he is talking about? Now, one of the vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers when it comes to talking about salvation, what do you think he is referring to? Uh, Ichung. What? Yes. Because he's talking about salvation, right? Redemption is about salvation, correct? Salvation from the power of They are redeemed with the blood of Christ, but redeemed from the vain conversation received by the tradition from the fathers. What do you think are the tradition from the fathers referring to here? If it has to do with redemption. Is it from like the uh, um, external um, keeping of the law by the party? Very good. Alright, which he will elaborate again afterwards. So one of the things they were redeemed from is to stop trusting in what the Jewish fathers 
taught them about how they are redeemed. They taught them that they were redeemed by the sacrifices. That's all. Redeemed by obeying the law. That's all. Not by the coming Christ. And they were still arguing at that time. No, it's not this Jesus. It's not about this. It is about still wanting to offer sacrifices. So they wanted to continue to, to do those things. And they wanted the Christians to say, you have to now still continue to make sacrifices in order to be saved. So that was one of the errors. Now please note why I'm telling you this, because there is an important point afterwards. Were the Old Testament people saved by obeying the law? And were they saved by the sacrifices itself? The answer is obviously no. Wait, is it? No? Let me, let me ask. Um, Kathleen, what do you think? The Old Testament people, were they saved by obeying the Ten Commandments and the animal sacrifices? Yes. Yeah, so there's this thinking, right? So some have this thinking. But here, he just told them, you look at verse 18, Kathleen. He just told them, you know, you are not redeemed by silver and gold. Verse 19, you're redeemed with what, Kathleen? Redeemed with? Verse 19. First Peter chapter. Very good. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, the tradition of the fathers, which were at that time constantly telling them, make sacrifices, animal sacrifices, obey the law, do, uh, observe circumcision, all those things. So he said, no, it's not these things. All right, get it? They were not. Peter just refuted. They were not saved by these things. But. Stop listening to them. Now, after this few proof from these few verses that they were definitely not. Okay, just remember that for now. But were there other, they also mentioned vain conversation of, from the fathers. The fathers handed down vain conversation. They had many extra beliefs, extra laws that were not given by God. Can we apply it to today? Well, today we know we are not redeemed, neither were the Old Testament people redeemed by the animal sacrifices and obedience to the Ten Commandments, for example, or any law. They were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. But ask yourself, as a Christian, after you got saved, are there vain conversations handed down to you that you still continue in it? Are there? are there. So, maybe I ask um, uh, Aaron. What kind? Say again. I can't hear you. Still continue to sin? Uh, not so much that. Well, they did want them to obey the law. Vain conversations. Ah, is cloth here? Oh, cloth is heavy. Okay, so cloth can answer. Then I ask um, um, Esther. Esther, can you think? Very often Christians, after they get saved, they may still actually have vain conversations, means vain uh, living beliefs from forefathers. Can you think of any? Don't have to live a holy life. You can enjoy your life. Um, no, it's it's their their beliefs. Well, I just said superstitious today for us. Superstitious beliefs and acts that our fathers, our ancestors believed in, and sometimes we can carry it. Maybe not so much for our generation. Now, any of you face that at home? You don't have to put up your hand, right? Where the older generation may have some of this and they carry it over, especially during when? Wait. Cry room people. Ben. Huh? Wedding ring. What about wedding ring? What's the superstition of wedding ring? Cannot wear wedding ring. Okay, come on and answer. 
<laughs> I have to ask. Oh, Kenny is very smart. Put put Daniel on his leg so he can't, he can't come out. <laughs> I got weight on my leg. What? What? For example. And weddings, like what? When children are born, maybe? When children are born, that is why I ask you out from the cry room. <laughs> right? When children are born, like what? Uh, maybe you cannot have like, hair for how many days, or you cannot take your feet away, or so. Yeah, you, you know? Like yes. I, I'm not saying your parents do that. I know your parents are Christians. But yeah, you know, maybe even Christian parents cannot cut nails. C- cannot what else? Wash your hair. Cannot cut hair. Cannot cut hair. All right. Well, maybe they believe there's some medical um, reasons, but by and large, very often they are actually vain traditions of men, superstitions. All right. Thank you. All right. Superstitions. Um, so they had that problem. One of the past the time of his journey is the Christian need to turn 180 degree around in some of these things. I hope none of you have. And if the problem is this, what they're facing is the Jewish fathers were pressurizing them. They have known the truth. They want to walk in the truth. But they are being pressurized. All right, so one day, some of you sitting here may get married, may get married, and your parents pressurize you to observe vain traditions. You must pass your time of your sojourning here in fear. Change your thinking. Must not succumb to the pressure. Now, those are some vain conversations uh, that we can think of. Yes, maybe others, it's like, why? why? Now, culturally, you see, for the Jews, so many things were mixed up. Their culture, their religion, all mixed up. Now, sometimes you will get cultural pressure as vain conversations from parents also, from fathers, right? Um, Mandy, did you face any vain conversations from culture? You can't do this and you can't do that, right, because of culture. Oh, not, not even superstition, culture, right? Yeah, so culture is another thing that can put a lot of pressure on the Christian. Right? I know those who live as um, Australians here, you say, ah, these are very alien to me. But you also, those that grew up in this country will also have certain culture that will be pressured on you as a Christian. With respect to family, with respect to your, your walk and all that, there will be all those. The Christian, as a sojourner on earth, never gets spared from this. All right? So don't succumb to superstitions. Don't succumb to cultural pressures. Can anyone think of a cultural pressure? Um, um, anyone? Wait, ask the, uh, Douglas, any? Maybe, well, the Chinese have very strong culture on filial piety, for example, right? Filial piety, culturally, correct? So, they say, oh, Christians are not supposed to succumb to filial piety. (laughs) Culturally, very strong. Can you think of an example where we cannot succumb to that cultural pressure? Uh, Shining. Bow down to parents. Well, it depends on what is the bowing down, right? So very often the bowing down is is kind of a um, ancestor worship kind of thing. In certain culture, bowing is not, all right? It's not. In certain culture, it is a sense of worship. Anything else? Uh, yes, at wedding there are many of these that sometimes require us. To, to bow down. Oh yeah, filial piety, stay at that. 
Yeah. Uh, who, who else haven't I asked? Uh, Jung. Okay, must obey father regardless of any situation, whether it's against your religion or not. Now, one of the most difficult cultural change for Christians when you get married. Hey, husbands, what is the memory verse? And uh, two, and they shall be? They shall be? <laughs> Didn't have father's fellowship for, for too long. And they shall be? Thomas. One flesh, alright? They shall be one flesh. For this cause, they shall leave what? Father and mother, correct? Leaving father and mother. I always wonder when I <laughs> preach on these things, how unbelieving parents, or even believing parents, actually there are believing parents who are, are, are quite angry at, at what we teach in BPCWA. And they, they accuse and say, they just keep listening to Reverend Joseph. And I'm thankful that some of them say, no, it is from the Bible, I'm listening to the Bible. It's just that Re Reverend Joseph happened to preach it, that's it. Leaving father and mother. But, hey, that is against filial piety, right? Filial piety is not to leave father and mother. And then you say, I'm, I'm, after marriage, I'm going to move out, especially when we have children, or we're going to have our own family unit. Then they want to stay with you. They want to live with you. They want to tell you how to live. You say, you're not filial. So some of these things, the traditions can become very difficult for us. Are we saying we don't honour father and mother? Please no. It's in the fifth commandment, honour father and mother. But the concept of honour and cultural filial piety, where it does not, where it contradicts what God commands, to be one flesh, to leave father and mother, means leaving their authority, all right? Not, not just say, as long as we don't stay with you. Leaving authority means now you have to be the head of the home, the man. So these are the things, all right? So please know, sojourners on earth, let your minds be occupied with, I must think biblically, and I must not succumb to pressure. They were reminded, please don't succumb to the pressure of what they tell you of how to be saved, um, how to live as, as Jews, that is more important than Christians, right? So all those things. So I hope we learn that. Now let's move very quickly. Um, what are we redeemed with? Question 41, very straightforward. We are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ. Why must it be so? Because in Hebrews 9.22, God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no cleansing, forgiveness, removing of sin without the shedding of blood. Okay? So, Christ must come and die. That is why the Lamb must be slain. The Lamb cannot be um, just roasted by fire. The lamb must be slain. Slain means there is blood involved. The lamb can't be hung on a tree and then let it suffocate to death. The lamb must be sh must shed blood. So the lamb that was described later on, the Christ as a lamb, Christ as a lamb, is to, is to remember Christ must shed blood. Okay, um, does God have blood? Uh, Joshua, does God have blood? God as a spirit, no. <laughs> God is a spirit. So, can God shed blood? He can't. But yet, it is by the shedding of blood. The life, not just life, eh? because life can be just hung to death. Must be life taken with blood. That is the sacrifice that the Holy God requires. Don't ask why. It's life for life. 
Life is in the blood, but it must be shedding of blood. All right, that is God's, God's, um, God's, God's um, requirement. So please don't think that it is just Jesus, Jesus' death. That's all. It is the blood. Very important. The blood is very often not preached today. Kathleen, have you been told you in for all your? Well, you joined us recently, so I'm picking on you. Um, what washes away your sin? Have you often heard is the blood of Jesus Christ? Holy water as well. <laughs> <laughs> Holy water. All right. So it's not all this. It's very clear. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Must remember only the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. Now, um, but why do I ask? Maybe I ask Elim. Elim, why do I ask? Does God have blood? No, God is a spirit. God doesn't have blood, right? Now, how can God have blood? Say again. In, in order for Jesus to have blood, but Jesus is God, Jesus is a spirit, how can Jesus have blood then? To shed. Very good. Human form. Jesus took on human form in order that he may represent you really and shed blood in your place. That is what he did. It's going to be described further after us again. Now, have you, have you ever thought of this? Actually, now it is the point to talk about this, but the precious blood of Christ. And then it says, as a lamb, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Let us just consider this, all right? Christ as a lamb. Now, I ask this question, what does the description of the lamb without blemish being slain for me do to my heart? Let me ask you, a lamb, what do you think of lamb? Julius, have you played with lambs before? Lamb, not, not like lamb, lamb, no? No, heaven. Who played, who have lived with lambs, played with lambs, know about lambs, L-A-M-B-S, lambs? Oh, yes, the one who study this kind of stuff, CP. Tell us more about lambs, CP. What's the characteristic of lamb? Fail. Huh? Very what? Fearful. They are very meek. Meek is the word, right? Meek. Yeah, no, you're looking for the word meek. They are very meek. Okay? As opposed to lion. Or, but the lamb was slain. Meek. What else about lambs? Can you think of? Australians must know, right? Uh, Okay, Dick, Dick, Dick and Adrian, lamb. Don't say it tastes very good, right? <laughs> Something about the characteristic. They're, they're not very smart. They're not very smart. Uh, I don't think it's about that, but um, uh, when the lamb is referred to Christ, yeah, when the lamb is referred to us, we are sheep. Not very smart, definitely. All right? But when we talk about the lamb that was slain, in verse 18, lamb, of verse 19, lamb that was slain. Maybe ask the, the, the young ones. Um, Julius, 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 what do you think lambs are like? Lambs are very... Very? Very what? White. Is it what he said? Very white. Yes? Very what? White. Bright, okay, very bright. Yeah, the lamb without spot, bright. Now, lambs are meek, and lambs, they don't resist when they are brought to the slaughter. That's one of the characteristics that we understand. They just meekly will just follow. All right? It's a very, um, very um, moving scene for, for someone to lead a lamb to the slaughter. It will, it will just go, it won't resist fight, it just follow. All right? It won't resist. Lamb are defenseless, correct? It can't defend itself. For Christ's case, he can defend himself, but he won't defend himself. He just let himself to be led by the soldiers 
betrayed by Peter, led by the soldiers, smitten, beaten, spat upon, humiliated, again and again, he never resisted. Put on the cross, never resisted. So, occupy yourself with this thought. Now, lamb without blemish, without spot. Why mention this? In other words, without blemish, without spot is, this is a perfect lamb. The farmers know a lamb without spot, without blemish, very, it is very difficult to find one. And when they find one, they will treasure it. They won't kill it. But for the Jews, they were told, for the, for the people of God, they were told, you must find the spotless one. And this is such a perfect, wonderful lamb, but yet it was slain, killed. So we are not farmers to farmers. So such a waste, such a waste of a good lamb. Who would do such a thing? So silly to sacrifice that. But without spot, without blemish, also refers to it is sinless. That is the point about without spot, without blemish, to reflect sinlessness. What must you think of? Not only is this lamb meek, won't defend itself, will let the slaughter person bring it to the slaughter, but yet this lamb is innocent. This lamb did not do anything wrong at all. Without spot, without blemish means it is nothing to do with the lamb in its being imperfect or naughty or um, 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 not precious because it has defects or something. Then the farmers say, kill it. No, innocent. So when you think of all this about Christ, what does it do to your heart? I'm not comparing Christ to my, to my dog, all right? I'm not. But when I read this, I thought about something. Until today, I often have the memory of the day um, we had to give one of my dog away, all right? We couldn't look after it anymore, so we had to give the dog away. And I never forget, till to this day, I was just a young kid, I looked from inside my house, I saw my dog all the way outside and the um, SPCA came to um, adopt the dog and I remember the dog, we just told, go, go, go with the man and he just obediently went, all right, obediently went but when he was going, he kept looking back at us and then when he reached the, the truck, they opened the back door and then he just stood there and he just kept looking at me, just kept looking at me until today, I never forget the sight. It's still in my heart. It's very difficult to live with. Um, then the dog went up. Now, I'm not comparing Christ to my dog. I want to make it very clear. Christ is the spotless Lamb of God. But what I'm saying, I ask myself, how come I keep thinking about my obedient dog that will just obey and go, and then it look lovingly at us, and then that was the last time we see it. Why do I keep thinking of that sight? But I do not let me sing. Sometimes I close my eyes and try to see, right? His cross, his suffering. That should be the thought. When you say, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, and then all these things, is pass your time thinking about Christ, the spotless lamb. Do you think about him on the cross? Do you think about, he's so innocent, nothing to, none of his fault at all. He was just carrying all our sins, but yet he just quietly bore it. Do you think about that? How often do you think about your Saviour that way? Now that is why we learn two kinds of fear, remember? We learn two kinds of fear. One fear is found in verse 17. The father who, who without respect of persons. One fear is fear the chastising hand of God. And even in the chastising hand of God, that fear is because he loves you to make you chase. 
And then what is the other fear that Peter now brings up? Past the time of your sojourning here in fear. One is the chastising hand of God, but here he deals with the reverential fear. The fear of grieving Christ. The fear of breaking his commandment and grieving him. The fear of sinning against such great love. He said, pass your, the time of your sojourning here with these two kinds of fear. Of course, if you have the second fear, you, don't, you won't need to have the first fear because you will always obey him, love him, keep his commandments, right? So, Peter brings all this picture up. The Christians were suffering. The Christians were going through persecutions. The Christians had many temptations to say, I'm not a sojourner. Why don't I just deny Christ? Why don't I just compromise and just lie and say, um, you know, I, I don't really believe in Christ and my life now would be comfortable. But he says, don't ever sin against Christ who died for you. Don't ever. Whenever we face temptation to sin, think of that. That is why the Holy Communion is a time where we ponder upon the Lamb of God on the cross. I always wondered, Peter who wrote this, what was he thinking of? Because he was the one that Christ looked at when he denied him three times and Christ turned and looked at him with that look. Now that's how I feel. I, I, I till today I feel that my dog feel that felt that I betrayed betrayed her. And I think, yeah, many times that is how. I, I don't think about how Christ suffered for me. I seem to love my dog more than him. How embarrassing. Let us ponder more upon our Saviour in that way. So without spot, none of his fault. None of his fault. Okay, now we move to verse question 43. When was Christ, when was Christ your, your sacrifice? When did Christ die? Shame. Physically. Yes, physically. Okay, I know you know it's a trick question. 2,000 more years ago. No, I'm not 5,000 years. Right? The earth is about that. It's, it's 2,000 over BC, uh, a, AD, right? Some 2,000 years ago. Now, the thing is this. Did you ever realize, you look at how Peter describes the Lamb of God Verse 20, who was verily, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Now let me ask you, the spotless lamb of God to be slain and will shed his precious blood, when was it foreordained? Before the foundation of the world. We like to say, when were you elected? When were you elected? Phoebe, when were you elected? Right, you didn't attend that class. We always say we are elect before the foundation of the world. Ephesians, right? We keep talking about that. We are elect before the foundation of the world. We keep thinking of that. But has it occurred to you? Yes, Christ died physically on earth at that point of time. But God says that even before the world, the foundation of the world was formed, Christ was already foreordained to be the lamb that would be slain. He would become human, take on human form. And shed so that he can shed his blood to save you before the foundation of the world. Now let me think, let me ask you, what would what should you think about then? When it comes to the love of God. Benedict. The question is: when you think Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world as the Lamb of God to be slain, take on human form to die for me. What should it do to our hearts? Love. 
loss of words because you're so moved or you don't know what to think all right may i ask hannah i must remember there are people here so that i don't neglect you you don't feel neglected what would you be thinking of say again moved why moved just before the foundation of the world yeah i was i was elect before the foundation of the world. why moved Even before he made the world, before he said, foundation of the world, be laid. Even before Christ did that, even before the Father, Christ and the Holy Spirit did that. Like, like Hannah said, he already knew that he was going to come before he made men. Because the found, man was made after the foundation of the world, correct? Before he made men, he already knew that he will and willingly will come to take on human form. Means, I haven't created the creature called man. Now please understand, when you study theology, theology must move your heart. All right? Don't just say, oh, before the foundation of the world, I can answer that question. A. Everything must be meditation. Remember meditation? Think more deeply. Means, he said, before I form men who are my creatures, I already decided that one day I will take on my creation form. And not only that, I will die for them who hate me, who will abuse me, who will betray me, who will reject me, who will humiliate me. But he says, before I form the foundation and make these creatures, I already say that I will be the Lamb of God that will be slain for them. This must move our hearts to no end. Think more about that. Now parents, some parents, even when they give birth to children, the moment the child comes out and if it's a deformed child or before the child comes out oh it's going to be a deformed child let's abort it the moment they know the heart of men they will abort their own child but god knew that we would reject him sin against him hate him but yet he would say before i do anything before i even form them i've already decided i will do that how many of us can say that if, so, if we knew someone was going to betray us, hate us, and do terrible things to us, how many of us can say, before I even do anything for the person, I'm already willing to do it, although I know that the person will do all this to me. That is the love of the Saviour for you. How must we not pass the time of our sojourning here in a fear that we sin against such love towards Him? Every time you want to love the world more, you want to put your studies more first, you want to put your, your, your job, your health, your life, you want to put all those things first. Then you ask, what did God put first in his heart? Even before he formed the world. Then you say, I must pass the time of my sojourning here in fear of sinning against such great love towards me. So I hope that um, you understand why God would use Peter to write these things with this kind of details. Because the Christian then, they are faced with many temptation to compromise, to give in, to deny Christ. You may say, I won't deny Christ. Frankly, a lot of us deny Christ by the way we live. By the choices we make, we already are deniers of Christ, um, betrayers of Christ by our choices in life. Alright, so... God will use Peter to move them, to move them. And remember this, theology must make you think about your Christ. Think about your Christ. Let me ask you, 
Christ said, before I form my creatures, they're going to be man, human, I will become human to die for them. What is so great about that? Let me ask. What is so great about that? What is so moving about that, Justin? That God will become man. You say you missed the question. Oh, the question is: What is so moving? What must be so moving that God would take on the form of man? So we all say, hundred percent man, hundred percent God, hundred percent man, hundred percent God. We are all very good at saying it. But what does it move in our? What does? What should it move in our heart? Take the form of man, not simple. Yeah. So yes, he is. All right. Let's try. God is a spirit. Then what? Infinite, eternal, right? But yet God take on physical form. Take on uh, the finite God took on a finite. The infinite God took on a finite body. The eternal God took on a, the, the creature's created form. Think more about that. Uh, for us, right? Ask you to wash the toilet. Church duty. Why must I wash the toilet? Why does somebody else wash the toilet? Huh? You know, I, I am a director in my office, you know. I employ people to wash the toilet. Maybe you ask, uh, maybe you ask uh, uh, Vincent, you know, or ask our students, Jeremy, ask them to wash the toilet. If you're honest, that's how we feel sometimes. Well, why me? I'm so high and important. I hope we don't think like that. But you just try and put that in perspective of infinite and then taking on the finite form. It's very difficult even to grasp that. But furthermore, Alex, is Jesus now in body form or spirit form? He has a glorified body, right? How do we know? He was walked through. No, how, how do you know? Misha, no, Misha. Um, Joash, Josiah. Josiah, how do you know Jesus is has a body now? You don't know. Jemima, does Jesus have a body now? Don't know. Shirlin, does Jesus have a body now? Yes, how do you know? You saw him last night. <laughs> how do you know? Yes, he, he showed them his hand. He made sure they knew I am human. I have a human body. Touch my wounds and all that. It's me, right? And it's physical, right? All right, Jennifer is very excited. So Jennifer, how do you know Jesus is still in body form? I can't hear. He said, yeah, you can feel me. But they saw him. The last time they saw him, he was in his bodily form and he ascended into heaven in his bodily form, correct? In his bodily form. So Jesus is, has always been spirit. He took on human form. Then from then on, is he just human or human and spirit? The Bible tells us the Son of Man who is on earth and also in heaven. So spirit as well as he has the human form. But Jesus took on the human form and, re, and he will have this Human body, sorry, this human body form for eternity, forever. That's why we will see him on the th on the throne, ruling during the millennium, right? Not to think of God, the infinite, to say before the foundation of the world, because of these people, they will hate me, reject me, humiliate me, turn against me. 
I, before the foundation of the world, already decide that after that point, in eternity, I will take on that body, remain in that body. I, I, was, I needed to be the representative to shed blood for them. How many of us would say that we are willing to go down to a very, very low level and forever stay in that level? I think we say, no, I don't think so. I don't think I'll do that. Look at verse, look at verse, um, verse 21. Who by him do believe in God, so we believe in God through Christ, that raised him up from the dead, so God raised Christ from the dead, and gave him glory. Do you understand now? That is why God says, my son will take on the humble human form, so that you can be saved. And that is why I give him all the glory. I give him the glory and every knee shall bow to worship him. Now Christ is willing to do all that for you. Before the foundation of the world, he already decided he'll come down to that level in order to save you. What are you not willing to be for him? Hmm? If I don't do so well for my exam, I may not become a manager. I may not be able to join a very big company. So let me give up time studying his word. Let me give up time serving him. Let me give up praying for the church, for, the, for his church. Let me give up all these things so that I can be this. Let, I, want, I want this kind of life on earth. I want to have this kind of position at the workplace. Why do I want to sacrifice time serving in church? When I could use that time to do things in my company that I can be rewarded with, to be someone. Remember what Christ was willing to be before the foundation of the world and into eternity and we will always see him every time you and i see christ in eternity let that thought be in our minds he is the infinite god and took on human form that is so humbling the creature form to be there in eternity that i may be saved that is why every time we see him it now changes into glory My friends, are there anything that you're not willing to be for Christ? Think carefully. Pass the time of your sojourning here thinking of these thoughts. Am I willing to be suffering, persecuted by my families, by my family because of Christ? Because I want to obey Him? No, I'm not willing to, Christ, although you're willing to be all that for me, but I'm not willing. Lamb of God, spotless Lamb of God, I'm not willing. I'd rather not be scolded, disliked, persecuted by my parents, by my friends, by my workmates, so that I can be a comfortable, you know, borrow Michelle's word, traveller, not sojourner. On earth. So I hope when we read these few verses, we think Paul, Peter is not simply say foreordained before the foundation of the world for nothing, to make us realize the cost Christ paid to be the Lamb of God to save you and I. It's, let's turn to God in prayer. Now, someone asked, what is the difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Someone also asked, can we just have instrumental music? Can, can we worship God with instrumental music?